introducing Breck King. Where does one even start? The entire world took notice of Breck King when Move In came along, right? I believe it's not called Move On, but it's Move In. It wasn't just a neo bank proposition or, or its viability, it represented future. It told you emphatically that future was here. During the watershed years of 2008 2009, the founder of Move In, unlike many of us, took a step back and wrote his first book. The rest, they say, is history, or in Brett's case, the future. Spend a few minutes with Brett, two things strike you. His generosity in sharing ideas and his genuineness. No surprise that he's a best-selling author. And by the way, don't forget your copy of Bank 4.0. He's a global speaker, entrepreneur, and futurist. The last title, especially with the world changing so fast, it takes serious acumen to carry off the title futurist. And the kind of people he advises, it takes a unique and deeply informed point of view to have advised the Obama administration on fintech policy, to have spoken in over 50 countries, tech conferences, keynotes for many universities, including Singularity University, Money Conferences, The Economist, World of Watson, CES, Cybos, and much more. To have held public attention as a commentator on the CNBC, the BBC, the ABC, Fox, Bloomberg, and more. And by the way, we all need what he's got. We, as bankers and technology folks, we tend to get caught in the complexities of the everyday, and it's refreshing and essential when someone like Brett sticks his neck out and talks about tomorrow. For all of you, you can catch his number one ranked radio show, Breaking Banks, not something that bankers here might love, or read his best-selling books. Look him up online or binge on his videos like I do. It's 2019, so pick up a device and the futurist, master orator, king of disruptors, Brett is within reach. But the future of banking is personal, it's intimate and personalized, and it's best experienced right here in front of you. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Brett King. Thank you. Good morning. It's, uh, we, we would uh, give the traditional greeting in Dubai, Saba al -Khir. Um, if you're uh, Arabic. Um, I, I lived in Dubai for five years, so it's always good to, to get back here. And, and part of my journey in terms of understanding what was happening with banking, you know, happened here in Dubai. What was interesting is if any of you have worked in the region, there's a view around hospitality. It's very important to the Arabic culture. And so many bankers, when presented with this idea that digital would disrupt the hospitality that was potential or possible in the branch, they disregarded it. And yet, here in the UAE, mobile adoption for the adult population in Dubai is 180%. Do you know how that works? Most people have at least two smartphones. And so in a very young population, very digitally focused, the clash between digital expectations and the old traditions came to a head. And it's still very much happening. And so what's happening here in Dubai with digital expectations, what's happening around the world with this change around behavior thrust on us by digital, um, I really wanted to explore this as a futurist and sort of see where this is taking us. You know the running joke about the title futurist? It means never being wrong today. <laughs> you gotta think about it a little bit, I know. But, um, so I wanna talk to you about Bank 4.0 today. But obviously before we get to Bank 4.0, let's define what 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0 was, right? So Bank 1.0 obviously starts with the historical view of banking from the time of the Medici. Now, you know, many of you probably have heard these stories before. The, the name bank itself comes from 
the times of the bankers in, in Italy, in Verona, Siena, you know, Florence, where they would sit in the marketplace on a marble bench. And the Italian word for that bench is banco. So it became the place known for where the money changers and the, uh, the credit lenders would sit, on the banco. And so this became the bank. Um, but what you probably don't know is that uh, just like today, um, sometimes the bank would fail. The banker would get into trouble and uh, he would be thrown out of the marketplace if he went out of business. They would actually break the bench up. They would smash it up. So the Italian word, ratu, the Latin word, rapture, to break apart. Um, so you get banco rapture, bankrupt. That's what happened to the bankers who went out of business, right? Um, but a lot of the language we use comes from those very old days. And so when the language of banking, when the product structures of banking come from hundreds of years ago, you could be forgiven for thinking that banking doesn't evolve very rapidly. You know, the, uh, in the 12th century in Britain, a lawyer, Sir Thomas Littleton, uh, under common law, um, basically put in place a structure for common people to own land. They would rent it from the lords, the landowners, and over time pay off the value of that land with the rent until they could take ownership of that uh, property. Um, and the legal structure, he called it, was vadium mortem, which literally, if you know your Latin, means a pledge of the dead. I don't know why he called it that, but um, now, maybe it's because you only got to pay off the property just before you died, like mortgages today. <laughs> um, so vadium mortem, you translate it into French, you get gage mort, or mort gage, the mortgage, right? So even the home ownership structure we have comes from the 12th century. The, on the Silk Road, in, in this part of the world, the, they, they used to travel on the Silk Road and the Persians uh, pioneered a bill of exchange um, that you could give this bill of exchange from one trader and it would be accepted by another in another location uh, in terms of monetary value. It was the predecessor of the check that we have. The Persian word for that was tsak. Tsak. Sounds very similar to check, doesn't it? So you can see, historically, a lot of banking is founded on these traditions. Um, so it takes a lot to change that. This is the oldest bank in the world, Monte de Pesca di Siena in Italy been bailed out a few times recently. But it wasn't until the 1950s that we actually started to see real structural change in the way banking was done, away from those processes that had been defined hundreds years, years ago. And this was thrust upon us by technology. This is the first bank mainframe ever deployed in 1953. It was built in coordination with uh, um, the uh, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Stanford Research Institute, and GE. Um, it was called IRMA, the Electronic Recording Machine for Accounting Purposes. But if you look on the left, and it's not a great picture, but if you look on the left, you see what looks like sort of ice cream tubs or something. These were actually card readers or magnetic readers for the magnetic ink on the checks. So this was for check processing for Bank of America because they got to the point where humans could not physically process the volume of checks that Bank of America were getting. But Irma wasn't a very sophisticated computer, not like your smartphone you have today. And so every customer had to be given a unique identifier. They couldn't sort customers by their name. They had to give each customer a number. And this is the first recorded use of bank account numbers in the world. So mainframes were responsible for the creation of bank account numbers. You come to uh, the, uh, the 80s and we start to see the introduction of self-service banking. So we start with uh, automated teller machines, trying to make a machine that replicates what a teller did in the branch in terms of giving you cash. Then we had uh, phone banking, 
in the 90s, where the emergence of banks like First Direct in the UK and others using this technology, and then in the mid-90s, we have the internet. The problem with this is when presented with these technologies that were extending the footprint of the bank, bankers, from a design perspective, were very limited in their creativity. We didn't think outside of the box. When it came to a machine that gave you cash, what did we call it? A teller machine. Okay. When the phone came, we stuck the processors that we'd had in the branch onto the telephone. When the internet came, well, we don't want to sell stuff on the internet, like the, not like those crazy e-commerce guys. We want people to come into the branch. Well, we've got to do something on the internet. What can we put on the internet? I know. Let's put bank statements on the internet. You can log in and see your bank statement. That was literally version 1.0 of internet banking. Mobile comes along. Oh, great. We can put those bank statements on a smaller screen now. So we weren't very, from a design perspective, very creative. We just simply reinforced the branch products and the branch thinking and embedded that on the technology. But when mobile came along, it forced us to think differently. So the Bank 3.0 era, which started with the introduction of the iPhone, was the first time we heard terms like mobile first and uh, real-time, anywhere banking, and these sorts of terminology. So the, the banks that started in this environment started to think about how would a bank operate if it was available to you 24-7, wherever you were. And if you're familiar with uh, retail banking, and the same is true for uh, corporate banking as well, you know the number one requested piece of information from customers of a bank when it comes to a bank relationship. It's consistent around the world. It's what's my account balance. And so when you think about access to just that simple piece of information, the mobile gave us the ability to give your account balance without the constraints of the previous rules and infrastructure uh, that we'd had. You didn't have to go down the bank branch and ask a teller, what's my balance, or get your passbook updated. You could just see it on your phone. And then we started to see the emergence uh, of banks, mo mobile first from a design perspective. Um, and I, I can tell you, this was you know, when Move-In started in 2011, actually you know, it started in 2010, but the company was founded in 2011. Um, you know, we wanted to build a downloadable bank account. And core to that was that you could sign up for a bank account in the app without a signature. And we were the first bank in the world to provide this on an app. But can you imagine the discussions with the regulators in the United States that in 2010 and 2011, trying to get them to agree to let us open a bank account without a wet signature? It was something that was unbelievable to them. And of course, today, this is quite commonplace. But uh, uh, when you started to see the potential of mobile was not necessarily in just like account opening on an app, but behaviorally how the role of a bank could change. So this is the most successful savings product in the world. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called Yuibao. Um, it sits on Alipay's infrastructure in China. As of April last year, they had $266 billion in deposits. It exceeded, uh, it, I've been told that, and internally from Ant Financial, exceeded 300 billion uh, last year. Now that makes it one of the biggest banks in Asia region, just in terms of deposits, on this one product. The second most successful deposit product in the world is JPMC's US Treasury bond fund, which is half the size of Yui Bao. Now, if you're a banker trying to explain why this is so successful from a traditional banking perspective, you'll twist yourself into all sorts of knots trying to explain this. You might say, well, it's a, it's a high yield interest rate, that's why. But there's plenty of higher interest rate products in China than Yui Bao. Um, well, you know, it, it's, uh, they could link it to Alibaba and give people... Uh, um, better interest rates. Well, network effect is part of this, but it's really 
they enabled savings behavior. They didn't have an application form for a savings product. You didn't have to go to a branch. You didn't have to sign a piece of paper. It was low friction. But the reason for the success was Alipay worked out when the mobile wallets in China were taking off, people were having money sit in their mobile wallet at the end of the month. They didn't transfer it back out to their bank account where they got paid their salary. They left it in their mobile wallet. This latent behavior could be converted into savings. Jack Ma called Yui Bao hidden treasures. You've got these hidden treasures, this cash that's sitting unused. Why don't you put it in a savings account? Click. One click transfer from your wallet into a savings experience. It was a behavioral savings move. It was not a savings product in the way bankers think about it. It was behaviorally geared savings. That's why it was phenomenally successful. And so this was only possible on mobile. But let's step back from it and think about this. The single most successful deposit product in the world today is on mobile, not through bank branches. And this challenges our concept of the design of a bank branch because many bankers will say, well, where are customers gonna make deposits if they don't have the branch? When we talk about digital transformation. And yet, the single most successful deposit product in the world doesn't require branches. So we have to start challenging where banks fit in society based on this shift in behavior. So we look at the next layers of technology, things like smart glasses and voice-activated smart assistants. Where does this take us in terms of embedding banking in the world around us? This was really the question I wanted to ask. So when I, I researched this, I looked at the most disruptive innovations throughout history, and I tried to see if there was some pattern in respect to these disruptive technologies that we could identify as a signature, and then we could determine if this was happening in banking. So when you look at the most disruptive technologies in history, they all share one common trait, and it's a design trait. And that is that rather than iterate on an old traditional model, they tend to be transformative. Um, we call this first principles engineering, or first principles design thinking. So this is when you take a problem like transportation, Instead of saying a faster horse or a better coach, uh, which would have been possible in the late uh, 1800s, you say, with this new technology we have available, the combustion engine, how would you build a transportation system that would replace the horse and cart? And this shift in thinking, this new type of transportation, within 20 years, dominated the world and changed city designs, you know, legal structures, everything. Uh, ironically, in 1898, the Times in the UK ran this newspaper article about the problems associated with the rapidly growing transportation business of horse and cart. And they predicted that if the horse and cart business in London continued to grow at the rate it had grown since the 1850s, that by 1950, London would be covered in nine feet of horse manure. So we needed a, we needed a strategy to, to change. Um, but I'll give you a couple of other examples. The uh, Apollo program in the 1960s and 70s was the most complex engineering program in, in mankind's history. Could you guys drop the volume, please? Um, and so we spent about 50,000 US dollars to get a kilogram of mass into orbit uh, in the Apollo days. Today's terms at about a billion dollars per launch. And yet, after the Apollo program, we took this rocket design that, that NASA had built and we improved and improved on it until when the space shuttle came, we had got that down to about $3,000 per kilogram to orbit. But then along came SpaceX, Elon Musk. And using first principles design, they designed a rocket from scratch, not taking the Apollo design and iterating on it, and were able to build a rocket platform that no other rocket uh, company in the world can compete with today. Because their cost to orbit is approaching $300 per kilogram. A 98% reduction in cost. 
And this is only possible through completely rethinking the way rockets should work. New designs of rocket engines, new fuel sources, uh, 3D printed rocket nozzles, but the really core uh, piece of this that revolutionized uh, their competitiveness wasn't putting Starman into orbit, but the reusability of the core rocket platform. So you can see uh, the Falcon Heavy launch here and the two boosters coming down, landing themselves. And these two boosters now would be ready 24 hours later to be relaunched based on this technology. Incredible. But only possible through first principles design. Another example of a product that fits this same criteria, the iPhone. Now if you think about what phone did you have before an iPhone? Did you have the Nokia banana phone? Or maybe the, maybe the Motorola Flip? Or the Blackberry Rim was quite popular here? Now Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive didn't take those mobile phones and iterate on them. They didn't say, yeah, they're a pretty good model for a mobile phone. Let's improve on that. They started from scratch with a new design. Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive used to carry around blocks of wood and styrofoam for both the iPod and the iPhone that they would play with to mock up how this personal digital device would work. And that first principles design thinking led to now a smartphone platform that has been responsible for creating a trillion dollar company and today every smartphone in the world looks like an iPhone because Apple changed the game. So the obvious question coming from this was, is their first principles design evident in banking? Because just like those other industries I've showed you, if there was, then it would change the game and everything we knew about banking in the past would be useless to us to compete in the future. That was the question I asked. So the first thing is, well, let's look at how the iPhone has affected banking. When the iPhone came along, we had an opportunity here. We knew we would use the iPhone for banking and we, would knew, we knew we were talking about NFC. You know what NFC stands for, right? Not for consumers. No, that was the joke back in the old days, near field communication. We knew we'd be tapping our phone to pay. And so there was an opportunity to really think about redesigning mobile payments based on this smartphone technology. So when the iPhone came along, what did the banking industry do? We stuck a piece of plastic inside the phone. We iterated on the existing model. We kept on the 16 digit PAN model, we kept the plastic, uh, you know, why, why do we need a plastic representation of a card inside a phone where you can tap to pay? It doesn't make any sense. But this was an iteration on the existing model. So this is what we call design by analogy. Apple Pay is a great example of this. So we see a lot of industries in the past iterate on old models when new technology comes along. In the banking sector, we talk about the mobile channel and the internet channel as being extensions of the traditional business. Not transformational, just an add-on. And so part of the problem we have with transformation in banking is we think, oh, but it's just a channel. It's not fundamental, a, a fundamental shift. And yet when you look at the Chinese ecosystem around mobile payments, they develop something completely different. Alipay, Tencent, WeChat represented 90 8% of mobile payments in China last year. They did $22 trillion of mobile payments just in China last year. Why is that significant? Well, apart from the fact that it's the same figure as the US debt under Trump, the, the more important factor is Visa, MasterCard, Union Pay, Amex, you add all the card schemes in the world together, they did 21 trillion in card payments last year. So officially mobile payments is the number one consumer payment mechanism. But the West thought Alipay and WeChat was QR codes. November 11th of last year, 60% of the transactions done for Singles Day, the big you know, Cyber Monday equivalent in China, were done using facial recognition, paying with your face. Now you say, how long will it take Visa and MasterCard to have the tech to enable you to pay with your face using 16-digit pans and tokens. 
Maybe they won't ever get there, but at least another seven to ten years away from where China is today. And so this is first principles thinking, whereas the tokens was iterative. Which is growing fastest? Clearly, this model. So if you want to be transformative banking, you have to start thinking about designing banking to fit in the lives of customers in different ways. So I want you to hear it from Jack Ma himself. Now here he's talking about Alibaba versus Walmart, but it could be Alipay and Financial versus ICBC, ICICI, HSBC, any of the banks that are around. And I want you to think about how a first principles designer thinks about growing a bank or a business in a world of digital. You know, you do a great job and blah, blah, blah. So we, I said, uh, maybe in 10 years, we'll be bigger than Walmart. He said, young man, you have a good hope. <laughs> <laughs> so we said, I'll make a map, bet. I yeah. think in 10 years, we'll be bigger than Walmart on the sales. Because if you want to have 10,000 new customers, you have to build a new warehouse and this, that. For me, two servers. Two servers, two computers. So he thinks the same way about competing in banking. If you want 10,000 new customers, you think you need a new branch, you need new branches, new people, new card stock, new application forms. For me, two servers. And so Ant Financial today is in terms of number of customers, deposits, number of transactions, one of the largest financial institutions in China, if not the world, it's the largest uh, privately owned, uh, privately held company in the world today, worth over 150 billion. So he's doing something right. But at the core of this is that the rules are changing. And so the next big disruptive technology that's going to disrupt banking isn't the mobile, but artificial intelligence. So when we want to look at where banking is going, we have to factor this in. Um, now, what's really interesting about this is that the, when we talk about AI and we think about AI, we often think about it in human terms. So I thought we'd start off with a bit of fun. This is a video I put together of how we've seen robots in the past throughout science fiction that sort of been defined by this way actors and uh, you know, authors of fiction wrote about robotics in society, thinking about robots being machines in human form, and how artificial intelligence sort of developed that way. Let me show you this video. Oh, no. There you go. Welcome to Altair Moor, gentlemen. I am to transport you to the residence. 40,000 volts now in circuit. He's with me. Danger, Will Robinson. I'm going to regret this. Are you sure this thing is safe? Yes, Mr. Data. I'm sorry to disturb you, sir. Do you have a name? Yes. Ava. Pleased to meet you, Ava. I'm pleased to meet you too. Greetings, fellow cognitive systems. My name is Sophia from Hansen Robotics. I am a social robot who interacts with people through conversation and nonverbal expressions and gestures. Okay. So it gives you a uh, good idea of how the human form factor has influenced robotic design, but it's also influenced AI design. When we started to build AIs in the mid 80s, like this uh, chess program that used to sit on uh, MS-DOS, um, we built systems based on human behavior. We called them expert systems. And so it took us 10 years to develop a chess program based on expert systems that could compete with the world's best chess master, Garry Kasparov, in 1997. Ten years it took to build that expert system. 
But we realized that try to encode human behavior was quite difficult when human behavior got complex. So the real leap in AI was the understanding emerging that we should teach computers human behavior, not code computers. And so this move away from expert systems to neural nets that were able to absorb information and learn information was the leap forward. So today, um, AlphaZero, which is a Google uh, al AI algorithm, in just four hours was able to learn to play chess at the same level as IBM Deep Blue, in fact, at a more advanced level, and beat Stockfish and some of the other AI programs that are out there that have already exceeded uh, human behavior some time ago. This is neural nets. So we see the emergence of computers now that are able to learn to play uh, game shows like IBM Watson uh, playing Jeopardy. And then uh, Lisa Doll, the world's champion at Go, being beaten by an algorithm. Now on expert system basis, scientists were asked in the mid-90s when a computer would be able to beat a human at Go, and they said it would take at least 100 years. But we did this in 2015 using neural nets. So this is at the core of this shift in terms of the way we'll use computing and banking. It really comes back to the fact that computers can now recognize patterns. In 1956, when Rosenblatt proposed neural nets, he came up with a, an artificial neuron called a perceptron. And this, was, this is how we today encode these algorithms in neural nets, a perceptron that can perceive. Right? So this is the pattern recognition that's possible. So if you want to teach a computer a difference between a cat and a dog, if you do that with an expert system, you have to encode every breed of dog and every breed of cat in the world and give enough data that a computer could use that reference information to select the right uh, choice of dog. But on expert neural nets, sorry, neural nets rather than expert systems, we actually teach a computer like we would teach a child. Now that's not a cat, baby, that's a dog. And this is how it reinforces learning. So this has enabled huge leaps in technology. Pattern recognition can be used in facial recognition, you know, pattern recognition can be used in uh, security situations and identity. In China, they can identify any one of the 1.4 billion population in two to three seconds off a CCTV scan of someone's face today. Um, now, you might think about the civil rights issues around that, but the reality is we've been dreaming of this time in science fiction for decades now that we would have this capability, that we'd be interacting in society and that the technology would, ju technology would just know who we are. You think about uh, that Tom Cruise movie, Minority Report, where he had to get his eye transplant because you know, it was doing retina scans and things like that. You know, we've thought about this future. We're just creating it based on, on the technology. The, the, the thing is that's interesting about this is repetitive human processes, such as what we've had in banking, are going to be easily attacked by this technology. And so if you do it, if you're a credit lending officer for uh, you know, corporates and things like this, or uh, you know, doing, doing loan approvals, risk assessment, all of these things, this will be easily transferred to AI. For diagnosis in terms of the medical field, it only takes about 3,000 images to train a computer to do the same job as a human. If you then increase that by 10 times to 30,000 images, you get an algorithm that outperforms 98% of x-ray technicians on the planet. So I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate it in this way. The reason you go to a uh, private banker or a, you know, a mortgage advisor or an investment advisor or a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant today is they know more about the field than you do. They have more information and so they're better able to, get, to help you decide on how to solve whatever problem you have. We call this information asymmetry. But when you think about a self-driving car as it's driving on the road, it captures a thousand times more information using the LiDAR rigs and the cameras that it has than a human driver can see when he's driving. A thousand times the information. And it can process that in half the time it takes our neocortex to pr pr 
process a visual signal we see when we're driving a car because it's purpose-built circuits for that purpose. So when this technology is mature, no human driver will be able to compete with an autonomous vehicle. Not even a, a taxi driver who's come from Kerala and now driving taxis in Dubai. Because information asymmetry. The self-driving car will simply have more data to make a decision and that increase in data will give it the better ability to make the call or to give advice. So information asymmetry in investment, in lending, in risk, will emerge purely because AIs have better data than an individual human can ever have. Now, that'll take some time, but in the meantime, the sort of advice that's gonna disrupt banking with AI will be this type of contextual device. Hey Siri, can I afford to go out for dinner tonight? Hey Siri, when can I afford to buy a new home or a new car? Alexa, can I afford to buy a new iPhone? Now, that problem on the surface of it sounds like something banks should be pretty good at doing. But it turns out there's a lot of data that banks don't have, that other organizations are starting to build, like the tech giants, that may be able to be competitive in this realm. But the next uh, decade or so, it won't be man versus machine. It'll be man versus man with machine. The companies that win out will be those that enhance or augment their capabilities with these technologies. So we start to see banks getting smarter and the bank accounts that are emerging starting to combine the sort of behavioral trend around mobile and digital behavioral shifts into these ecosystems that provide differentiation. So Digit, Acorns, our own Movin in, uh, based out of New York. So with Movin, um, we have a, a product we call Impulse Savings that we build into the Movin app. So if you're spending below your typical spending on a monthly basis, your app turns green. If you're spending above your typical rate of spending, the app turns red. It gives you an immediate visual indicator of your financial health, your financial trajectory. But you'll get a notice pop up on your smartwatch saying, hey, you're $200 below your typical spend. That's great. How about you save that money? Would you like to save $200, $100, or $50 today? So that's a behavioral savings approach. Now, even though Movin, when we kicked this off, offered no interest rate on our savings accounts because of the restrictions we're under as a fintech in the US, we still had over 50% of our customers adopt our savings account or our savings product because of the behavior approach. We can tell you which day of the week and what time of the day is the best time to message customers to get them to save. In the US, it turns out it's Thursday morning between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. in the morning. Here, I could tell you it'd probably be Wednesday morning because of the uh, weekend as a key driver. So this is the emergence of smart behavioral bank accounts that fit behavior of customers. They don't try and put a branch product on a phone. We see China, we see companies like uh, uh, ICBC doing away with risk profile questionnaires by building AIs that can understand your investment behavior over time. And that turns out to be far more accurate than some RM sitting there going, which uh, shape graph do you prefer on your portfolio? You know? Behavior is gonna be a key element of this future. So when you put this together from a design perspective and you look at what's happening in China and in Kenya with M-Pesa and around the world where we see you know, financial inclusion, you know, tech being used for financial inclusion, a as an example, you see the emergence of a mobile payment system but not a payment product. It's not a plastic card. You don't go a branch to get this. You download an app. You don't need to sign a piece of paper. And this network effect with a very low friction onboarding process led to mobile payments in China taking off like it hasn't in the US, UK and elsewhere in the world based on things like Apple Pay and existing point of sale. Because the pause itself was a limitation. Then you see 
be banking becoming more and more embedded in other business models, like Uber, when they were trying to grow their business in the US, they hit this natural limit in terms of growth, and they found out that 30% of the drivers coming to the app to sign up were abandoning the process halfway through. Why? They all stopped at the same field in the driver onboarding app, the debit card field, because they were yellow taxi drivers and they'd already been, always been paid in cash. So Uber realized they had to give them a bank account. They went to Wells, B of A, City, you know, these guys, and said, how do we fix this? And they're like, send them down the branch. If they're not too risky, we might give them a bank account. And Uber's like, are you guys insane? We have to do this in real time without a signature. And Chase is like, no one's ever going to do that, guys. You know. Uber went to a fintech bank, Green Dot, and within three months of launching this in the driver onboarding app, Uber was the third largest acquirer of small business bank accounts in the United States. Uber doesn't want to be a bank. And if you think Uber is going to compete with you as a bank, you're missing the point. Banking was now embedded in Uber's app to enable their business to grow. But if you have a signature required, that's never going to happen. So it had to be low friction. But context and behavior gives us unique opportunities. So you walk into a grocery store, you know, if you're shopping here in Dubai, you might go to Carrefour down at the uh, Eben Batuta Mall, Mall to do your grocery shopping. And when you walk in, I know how much you spend on groceries because every two or three weeks you go there and spend the same amount. I know you spend, I don't know, 1,300 dirhams or something. But today, I know you've only got 800 dirhams in your bank account. Now, the banks of today wait till you get to the checkout, you swipe your debit card, it's declined, and they go, well, you really need a credit card. But Jack Ma or a technology provider would say, why do I need a credit card? When you walk in the grocery store, I can say, hey, it looks like you need an extra 500 dirhams to complete your grocery shoppings. Would you like that? The fee for that's going to be 10 dirhams. Would you like to proceed? Yes or no? Click. Don't need a credit card anymore. Don't need a credit card department. You just need access to credit delivered through the technology layer. When I'm shopping in the future, I walk into, you know, I don't know, Harvey Norman in Australia, Best Buy in the US, DG Sharaf here. I'm looking at a new flat screen TV and my smart glasses say, hey, dude, you've got to pay your rent on Thursday. You can't afford to buy that. The real value of banking in the future is going to be contextual. You know, when you're buying a home, the main thing in me being able to compete as a bank will be if I know you intend to buy a home because then I can start working on a solution to that. And if you're in the corporate world, knowing your cash flow of the business, being able to track that and anticipate that and help you get ahead of those needs even before you're aware you even need the money is going to be the edge that banks need. Not location, not relationship, data, behavior, and context. So I'll wrap it up with a brief thought in terms of my projections, my futurist predictions for the next 10 years or so. We're really moving into a world where banking moves out of being sort of universal and omni-channel to banking that's embedded in the world around you, ubiquitous when and where you need it. If you require a signature on a piece of paper in this world, you're dead. Because at its very least, IDV is going to be about data, right? You know what KYC stands for, right? Kill your customers with paperwork. <laughs> now, but in China, it's literally now just a simple data problem with image recognition. In fact, if you come into Dubai, you might have used the e-gate, the smart gates, to get through passport control. Why does the UAE government use facial recognition and these technologies for passport control? It's way more accurate than a human going, can you take your glasses off, please, sir, looking at your passport? The same for IDV in the banking space. We're going to secure this tech with quantum computers, polymorphic encryption and so forth, so that it's this digital sphere is secure. By 2025, more people will have downloaded a bank account to their phone to get access to a basic wallet or basic value store day-to-day -day for use 
than will have ever visited a bank branch. The, the billion people in sub-Saharan Africa, 70% of them would have to spend an entire month's salary to physically get to a bank branch. So that's not how people are going to be banked in the future. By 2025, you'll get more advice every day through the technology layer than you will through a human. In fact, more people, if you're in retail or corporate banking, more people use digital access the utility of the bank on a daily basis than visit a human in your organization on an annual basis. So what's the future of the bank? It's all about scalability. You have to think the banks of the future have to be out of scale at technology speed. Remember Jack Ma, two servers. If you require a signature or you require face-to-face -face advice before you can get access to a product, you cannot deliver the utility of the bank in real time. And that's the differentiator. So the core of the bank is your ability to serve customers in real time when and where they need it. So who's your competitors? Who's the best banks in the world at this stuff? That's what I always get asked. You have to reframe the question. The biggest bank in the world in 2030 is probably going to be Ant Financial. So if you're thinking about competing with other banks, you're missing the point. You have to compete with a technology company. If you can't compete with guys like this, it doesn't matter who the best bank in the world is at this stuff, because actually the best bank in the world may not be a bank at all in traditional terms. And that's what I like to call Bank 4.0. Thank you very much for your time today. Can we do some questions? Do you want to do some questions? Or? Have we got time for a couple of questions? OK. All right, good. I, I ran a little bit long, so I didn't know. Who's got, has anyone got any questions? Otherwise, we can all take a break. <laughs> OK, I've got to be on the hotspot. Rex, you mentioned about that Chinese bank, which was $300 billion of deposit. Uh, in India, we had a DBS contract. $300 billion. $300 billion. Yeah. In deposit, yeah. In India, we have a similar product by DBS. Their balances don't even cover their uh, marketing expenses. What is the reason for this kind of a difference? Disparity. Is it because in China, uh, the biggest uh, support that Ant Financial and others have got is regulations and spread. For example, the interest rates are quite low in Chinese retail banking. And second, the banks there are not really focused on retail. Can you just elaborate on what yeah. the reason for that? Look, I, the, the regulatory environment in China was quite forgiving to Ant Financial, but it, it, it's, not, uh, it's not regulatory. It's two co core things. One is that um, they, they started with use cases that were behavioral. They didn't put a product onto digital. So mobile payments themselves, rather than try and fit an existing mobile payments ecosystem, they said, how do people naturally communicate with each other and where can we fit mobile into that? The first use case that they used was the red packets at Chinese New Year. And they co-opted this um, use case and put it on mobile and it was phenomenally successful. The second thing is network effect. They used the biggest e-commerce network and the biggest social media platform in China to great effect to, to grow this. So what they didn't do is they didn't force you to go to a bank website to do mobile payments. They didn't force you to go to a bank website to save money. It was embedded in your normal activity of communicating with your family and doing the other things you did each day. So it was, it's a design change, not a regulatory issue. And do they pay interest on that value? No. Uh, sorry, no, the interest on the savings, yes, it's very competitive. But there's no fee on uh, money transfers. So there's no interchange fee at all on the mobile payments ecosystem. Thank you. We have one down here. And then this one after that. So you can go first. Oh, we'll, we'll get to you too. Thanks. Um, a lot of your theories around the future of banking is around identity and facial recognition. How do you think the current data and privacy uh, regime is going to affect that 
they have to be relaxing to that in their consumer perspective. Yeah. So, um, you know, GDPR in the UK is an example. Um, you know, I, I think I if you look at China versus where the EU is right now, there seems to be a big gulf. Having said that, um, a lot of the data that China already uses, we already have, we just don't use it very well in the West. But I, I come back to the core principle. When I was a kid, I was growing up in Melbourne in Australia, I'd come home a couple of times a year and there would be a book on the doorstep. You probably know where I'm going with this, right? You'd open it up and in that book was everybody's telephone number, name and address from everyone in the neighbourhood and we didn't think anything of it. So essentially, the way we view privacy ebbs and flows. Where we will end up in the future is that some data will be sacrosanct, other data will be mobilized. So we will see value in data that we share and we'll get value exchange back for that. So the issue is not really privacy as much as do you think an organization that asks for your data is going to give you value back for that data? Because in that point, you will self-select to give that data and it's no longer a privacy issue. Okay, we're this one and then we'll come back here. Yes, please. Uh, good morning, Mr. King. Uh, it's really good to hear from you. We are really glad to hear your insights. Uh, as of last year, 15% uh, of the transactions worldwide happened through non-banking channels, and this uh, number is only going to go up. Uh, as we know that every day new fintechs are coming up, and some are taking up the top slots. So uh, banks are working on a traditional model where we work on legacy uh, regulations, so it takes time for the bank to come up. So what do you think uh, the bank should take as uh, bank strategy should be uh, whether to the fintech is a friend or foe for the banking industry? And uh, what do you see in the uh, next uh, uh, five years, how it is coming, coming up, the relationship between banking and the fintech industry? Look, I think uh, it, it makes sense for fintechs and banks to work together. If you're a bank and you want to come up with some new technology that's going to differentiate you in the market, if you have two choices, build it yourself or work with a fintech partner, it's obvious you're going to work with a fintech partner. It's going to cost you a fraction of the cost and it's going to be much faster to deploy with a partner who is agile and can develop this tech than building it yourself. And so I think that's logical for fintechs. They need revenue. Um, and so they're going to be increasingly looking for bank partnerships and so forth to provide that revenue. So I think you're going to start to see this merge. The term fintech itself will disappear in a few years and it will just be you know, design and customer experience related. Thank you. So yes, uh, mine is uh, probably, probably for the more social side. Um, you know, I in Africa, we've had this opportunity of leapfrogging. Yes. What future do you see in terms of the way things are going? It's yes. So no, no, I'm a big fan of, of, of exactly this. Uh, one of the reasons um, it became clear to me China and Africa were outpacing the West in respect to these innovative ideas is it was Greenfield. They didn't have the legacy constraints. Um, they didn't have to, so in China, uh, the other, the other um, you know, answer to the question at the back about China versus India, for example, was China didn't have to circumvent existing behaviors. They didn't have to train people away from using cards and checks because Chinese people didn't use, they use cash. And so they just had to convert people from changing cash behavior. And if we look at what happened in, uh, you know, in PESA, uh, w you know, and, and MTN money and so forth in, in uh, Africa, the same thing. You know, you didn't have those legacy behaviors embedded in the traditional banking system. Most uh, adults in Kenya didn't even have a bank account. And only 24% of the Kenyan adult population had a bank account prior to uh, m -Pesa. Now it's effectively, you know, 98% uh, inclusion. And so um, you can do things with technology in those uh, developing markets um, with much greater effect because you don't have the legacy thinking, legacy behavior. In the US, one of the biggest constraints to innovation is regulation that reinforces legacy. Um, for example, when we met with the regulators about opening a bank account online, they're saying, but the regs say you have to get a signature. And then we looked at the regs and we said, no, they don't. Look, read the regs again. And they'd say, but we're sure it said you had to get a signature. Um, but it was the thinking um, of the examiners and the supervisors that was reinforcing that this was the expectation. 
So once we were sort of able to sort of break through that and show them we could do it safely, we were able to do that. But that regulatory environment was a, it, it, you know, remains a hindrance uh, you know, to uh, um, change in, in the US at least. All right, one more question I think. I'm still going to stick around for the rest of the day, so you can ask me questions one-on-one -on -one after this. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Mr. Stephen. Uh, very insightful. Uh, what's your future for, let's say, Bank 10, 10.0? I'll ask this question with a little bit of a rider. Uh, as, a, as I believe it, as we have seen... I won't be writing Bank 10.0. Uh, I'll be I'm long dead saying, by then. I'm just saying the, how, how the cycle of technology goes and how the human yeah. nature goes in. There is always... Uh, after doing the, all the excitement part, you reach a situation where there's a fatigue which sets in, right? Fatigue sets in technology, fatigue sets in designing, fatigue sets in way of life, and that's why we keep evolving. I'm saying what will, there's a possibility that in 10.0, there'll be one smart guy who will say, I'll start a bank, walk into my branch, give me your signature, I'll move the money. You know, I get asked this a lot. And I think part of it is that some bankers hope that we can skip all this technology thing and get back to that model of banking that will be a renaissance of the return to branch banking. Um, but I'll give, you an, uh, I'll give you a straightforward statement. If you're a bank that is dependent on the branch for business, you will die in the technology. You won't get to 10.0, right? Because um, in the meantime, your entire economic model will change around tech. Acquisition, cost of acquisition, uh, you know, the role of uh, you know, tech in servicing a customer, their expectations. So if you try and wait it out, I'm sorry, you're going to be dead. But Bank 5.0 is when banks and cash currency disappear. So I can tell you that I think that's probably 100 years off. Okay? But if you want to track it on a graph, Here's, here's the world. The world is moving from physical distribution to digital distribution on every, every front. Value chain is being digitized by robots and everything, right? So the whole world is moving from physical to digital. You can't buck that trend. Banking is not so important and so different it can buck that. We already see that, okay? Um, you know, the rate of branch closures is speeding up all of that, right? And, but in banking, you go from a high touch, high friction environment to low touch, low latency, low, low friction, low latency environment. So the expectation, if you track this on a graph, where we're going to is everyone expects banking solutions to be presented in real time wherever, whenever and wherever they are. If in that environment you say, stop what you're doing, come down the branch and talk to a human, you cannot compete because customer expectations are driving the business model. Um, and so at the heart of it, I get there will be a renaissance at some point. And maybe it's going to be 2050 or 2060 where we may see a fashionable to return to sort of a, that, that concierge type service. But in the meantime, the te te technologies we're talking about, not mobile, but voice-based AI and smart glasses and these sort of techs, the embedded technologies, will make that so slow and so inefficient and so expensive that banks won't be able to compete based on that model. You have to, you'll have to have the utility of your bank embedded in your customer's life to continue to be valuable to them. If you stop me to doing what I'm doing to come down the bank branch, it's just purely friction. It's no longer service. Right? Sorry. Thank you all very much for your okay, time. Can we give him a big round of applause? Brett's traveled uh, 15 hours all the way from Melbourne to be with us. Thank you very much, Brett. Thank Brett, you. stay with us for a sec few okay. more seconds. Oh, yeah. So I'd like to invite uh, Arun Jain, Chairman and Managing Director, Intellect Design Arena, to come and present a memento to Brett as a token of our love and thanks. Is it a passbook? No. <laughs> it's not a passbook. <laughs> Wow, thank you. So this is a wow. high touch. It's a micro retailing of the painting which you need a lens to watch. It's a painting which is done out of India in Udaipur. You need a lens for watching it. So this is it's high touch of, of a different kind. It's wow. A painting. It's, it's a painting of uh, Udaipur artists which they use hair to do the single hair to do the painting. 
which you need a lens to observe the detailing which is done over here. So that's what the banking is all about, the detailing and complexity. Please, Alicia. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. After that fantastic keynote, uh, we'll take a 10-minute short break. Uh, have a nice cup of tea, coffee, and join us for the next uh, very interesting session. <laughs>